My name is Tejaswini Niranjana. I am director for the Center for Interation Research. Uh, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce this new series that we have on perceptions of risk in the Himalayas, uh, curated by my colleague Suchismita Das. Uh, we also have uh, two other amazing series uh, which are ongoing. One is and uh, Safwan Amir. And we have another new series on South Asia in the South China Sea, which is a collaboration with uh, two universities in Hong Kong. Uh, please do sign up for these, and we hope that you will be uh, joining us for the other talks in those series as well. Uh, not to mention, for the rest of the very wonderful talks we have lined up here in this particular series too. Uh, for those of you who are coming for the first time to an event organized by the CIAR, I just want to tell you that we are a relatively new center at Ahmedabad University. Uh, our aim is to bring together uh, different regions across Asia uh, in terms of common questions that we can articulate. Uh, we have a, a bunch of different initiatives, including the Himalayan Asia one, uh, which is uh, sorry coordinated by uh, Neil Kamal Chapagain and Sujisvita Das. And uh, this series is an outcome of some of the discussions we've been having through that Himalayan Asia cluster. Uh, so welcome to our first speaker in the series. It's an honor to have you with us, Shubhra. And I'll hand over to Suchi Smita to introduce the speaker and introduce the series also. Uh, thank you, Tejaswini. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. So I am Suchi Smita Das. I am an environmental anthropologist, broadly interested in questions of uh, development, climate change, adaptation, biocultural diversity in Sikkim, uh, in uh, Northeast India. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Ahmedabad University and a fellow of CIAR. So through this webinar, what we were thinking about uh, was to bring together different researchers from different disciplines across the region to then reflect on how uh, notions of risk and allied terms such as crisis, disaster, vulnerability have been constitutive in shaping the materiality, the geopolitics, the history, cultural articulations of the region. In recent news, uh, uh, the Himalayan region has almost become synonymous with disasters and risk. Uh, uh, when we started thinking of this uh, webinar, since then we have had uh, uh, the uh, major glacier lake outburst flood in Sikkim, uh, which killed more than 50 people, the tunnel collapse in Uttarkashi, the older Mizoram bridge collapse, all of which point to this precarity of life uh, and terrain over here. So through this intervention, what we want to do is to historicize, to denaturalize the concept of risk and to ask critical questions about our commonsensical acceptance of the term and the kinds of actions, the kinds of reactions, uh, emotions that it en engenders. So to think of some broader questions as well in terms of how this calculability of risk is at the heart of this project of modernity, and to then uh, not be able to calculate the risk as it is becoming increasingly untenable, how then do we question the projects of development progress? Uh, also, there is a criticism that overemphasis on risk leads to um, this kind of inertia, paralysis among people. So how do we as academics contribute to a discussion which doesn't only advocate for a return to status quo, but also for some kind of positive future? Uh, we are hoping also to bring together environmental anthropologists, ecologists who will think of risk in more than human terms, to think about the risk to biodiversity in the region, to think about coexistence, bringing together anthropologists who will think about the question of cultural risk, to think about also decolonial grounded perspectives of people on the ways of vulnerability which affect them. So with these kind of broad questions, what we have today is a talk by uh, Dr. Shubra Sharma, who's an earth scientist. Uh, and uh, she will be offering a historical perspective on risk in the region, history being uh, the history of the earth itself. And she will be talking about geomorphological hazards, which have uh, shaped the Himalayan topography and how they interact with anthropogenic interventions, which then affect the lives of people in the Himalayas. Dr. Sharma is an assistant professor in the Geoscience Division of uh, Physical Research Laboratory, PRL Ahmedabad. She has previously been an assistant professor at Banaras Hindu University and an inspired faculty at Aysar Mohali. Her research focuses on understanding the interconnections between different systems such as glaciers and fluvial response to climate variability, 
the impact of hydrometeorological events on geomorphic processes. And she also writes in popular science, uh, writes popular science uh, articles for public consumption. And I can personally attest to how my understanding of the Joshimut uh, uh, crisis was uh, highly influenced by how she was able to break down complex scientific phenomenon for lay audiences. So I'm very happy that she's starting off our seminar. So I'll hand it over to you now, Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much, Suchismita, and thank you, uh, Tejaswini. And uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, it's a great opportunity. So I'll just start sharing my screen and start with the talk. Okay. Uh, I hope my slides are visible along with the pointer. Yes, all good. I'm yes. not able to see your faces. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's visible. OK, OK. So uh, as uh, Suchismita said, today I'll be talking about uh, the Himalayas. In the perspective of risk, I'll be talking about the physical vulnerabilities, what are the terrain characteristics which make the terrain so vulnerable. And that automatically leads us to the disasters. And uh, when we are uh, talking about disasters, we are essentially also talking about uh, the people who are either staying in Himalaya or are being influenced uh, by it. So that is how my talk is also uh, structured today. Starting with uh, the origin of Himalaya, how the journey of Himalaya started um, or how it's, it was started in making was about uh, 120 million years ago when Indian subcontinent, which was part of a larger supercontinent called the Pangaea, broke off and it started drifting towards the uh, Eurasian plate, that is Eurasia plus uh, Asia. And uh, as it moved towards the Eurasian plate, I hope this place, okay. Um, the margin of the Indian subcontinent, it was buckled up along with the sediments of the uh, oceans uh, known as the Tithus Sea that was lying in between Indian subcontinent and Eurasia. And also, uh, as we know that the Indian plate is subducting or it is going underneath the Eurasian uh, uh, plate. And this squeezing up and this buckling up of the sediments and rocks led to the formation of the mighty Himalayas as we see them today. This is a satellite imagery of the Himalayan ranges. We know that they are divided into different uh, ranges. So on, in, on the left, you see the Indoganstic plain here. Then we have the sub-Himalaya or the Shivaliks. And um, then we have the lesser Himalaya. The white snow-clad peaks is uh, are those of the higher Himalayan range, one of the most spectacular topography on the earth. To the north of it, when we go, we find the trans-Himalayan region. And of course, then we have the uh, Tibetan plateau. Now, uh, these ranges, they do look majestic and they are majestic. However, if we look at their bedrock or their uh, rocks, they are very fractured, fissile and fragile because of this ongoing compression, uh, which started off uh, as Indian plate collided with the uh, Eurasian plate. And this subduction, this compression is continuing as on today. So if you look at the rocks, they have joints, as in this first picture, you can see there are two sets of joints. One is horizontal and one is vertical. And also uh, we see faults or uh, the cracks of fractures, which not, are not only on the surface, but they go well beneath the surface as well. And many of them, they are regional in um, scale. Also in um, Himalayan rocks, we find presence of cavities like this. It, it is, of course, dependent on what type of uh, rock type is there. This picture is taken near Joshiwat. So uh, the solid mountain, solid rocks that you are seeing actually has lots of joints, fractures, and it may be having such hollow uh, cavities. 
and uh, of course there are intense folds as you can see this one here this is a large scale fold uh, somewhere in janskar himalaya again suggesting us telling us the strength of the ongoing compression and how fragile how fragile these uh, rocks are and these fragile rocks they are again shaken by the seismicity or the earthquakes we all know that himalayan region is known for earthquakes this snapshot is from the um, sector of western and central himalaya this is the upper ganga catchment and the dots that you are seeing here relates to the magnitude of the earthquakes between 1981 to 2018 the number of yellow and blue dots that you are seeing here they represent the smaller earthquakes or the micro seismicity often they are not even felt by us but they play a very critical role in preconditioning the ground as they weaken the rocks already fractured and fragile rocks and they prepare sort of a ground for um, the other disasters like landslides which may be then cascading into impounding of the rivers which may further cascade into flash floods and so on and so forth so often these disasters they are interlinked with one another and uh, therefore the risk associated with these disasters and hazards they are also very uh, complex i just want to convey a message here that uh, it's not only the steepness of slopes in the himalayas that make it fragile and we can just not um, classify it on the basis of steepness of slope this is a graph uh, which was given by uh, late professor valdia if you look at the average area percentage area of slope so y axis has average slope from 0 to 100 and x axis has um, area uh, of the of uh, area of the slopes so if you look say about 80% of the area has slope uh, near 20 to 25 degree that means most of the himalaya does not have a very um, very steep slopes but these rocks as we saw in the previous slides they are jointed they are fractured they are also overburdened by the sediments and that is what makes them fragile on top of that there is micro seismicity and uh, bigger earthquakes as well now overlain over this fragile terrain this fragile bedrock are two climate systems which are continuously supplying it with snow and rainfall feeding its glaciers and rivers and modifying the uh, earth surface of the himalayan range so this is a digital elevation model which shows the stretch of the himalayas we have karakoram range here and uh, these are the uh, geographical sectors of himalaya one system is that of the mid latitude westerlies embedded within those come the western disturbances they are largely responsible for the winter Uh, rainfall um, or the snowfall that happens in the higher mountain most of it is arrested by the karakoram and second system is the indian summer monsoon both arabian uh, sea branch and bay of bengal branch influences the um, himalayan system and of course there is a gradient associated with these two climate systems for example with the westerlies when they travel from west towards the east their influence in terms of how much moisture they will supply it decreases also with indian summer monsoon as they move from south to north as they move further into the valleys the the moisture they supply into these valleys that also decreases and there is another gradient associated with it from east to west and all these gradients these interactions they make uh, the dynamics very complex and hard to predict as well so this is just a schematic representation of how the proportion of these two weather systems uh, they would vary how the importance would vary in terms of how they influence the uh, climate of the region so if we were to take a profile from indo gangetic plain up till say karakoram so a profile means i take a horizontal distance at a regular interval and measure the elevation above sea level we'll get this something like uh, this gray graph that you are seeing and these red clouds are schematically representing the 
uh, Indian summer monsoon and blue clouds are representing the uh, mid-latitude westerlies. So till the higher Himalayan, uh, greater Himalayan range or the higher Himalayan range, we have the dominant, dominance of Indian summer monsoon and they are not able to really cro cross this topographic orographic barrier and the influence decreases considerably and thereafter the mid-latitude westerlies, they uh, dominate. Now, this does two things. This In this graph, again, uh, I have drawn the elevation profile. So on x-axis, we have the distance, horizontal distance from Indogangetic plane, and y-axis has the uh, elevation. And this orange line that you're seeing is the um, topographic profile or elevation versus horizontal distance uh, graph. And this blue line is the total annual precipitation across the same region. Now you see two peaks are there uh, near main boundary thrust and main central thrust MBT. And these are the zones of high focused erosion, particularly this physiographic transition where slopes are also steep. It is also known as the southern mountain front. It feeds into a lot of sediment mobilization. This is also known as the hotspot for generation of uh, landslides. So uh, there are certain hotspots or um, fragile zones within this fragile terrain where we need uh, to be extra cautious. And of course, this uh, topography not only influences the precipitation gradient, but that in turn dictates what kind of vegetation we are seeing there, what kind of uh, earth surface processes uh, we are uh, seeing there. So, uh, like independently, um, these systems, uh, we are able to see that how the rocks are fragile, how the uh, precipitation gradient of the two climate system varies. However, things are not very simple when all the things they interact with another one another. I just wanted to highlight this by giving one example uh, that uh, these systems, they can couple or decouple themselves, changing their dynamics. For example, intuitively, we may think that the largest uh, landslides, they may happen on the ste steepest uh, slopes. But uh, there was a study by Roback et al. It was conducted after Gurkha earthquake, which happened in 2010-15. And they found out that uh, the large or the moderate landslide, they actually happened on moderately steep slopes, but they were weathered or they were broken uh, and crumpled slopes. And also it had to coincide with high annual uh, precipitation. So rainfall had to be there. This is what is shown in this graph. So y-axis you have the landslide density and x-axis we have the elevation. And this another y-axis, this is the percentage of slopes that is above 40 degree. So this gray line here represents the density of the landslide. So it is peaking somewhere, uh, say about 2,000 to 3,000 meters of elevation. But the slope is also not very high. The mean slope is about 20 to 25 uh, degree. Now, does that translate into risk? Not necessarily, because uh, the region that you see here, fewer landslides, but larger landslides, which happen in the higher Himalayan range, uh, on the steeper slope, they are they have the potential to create more disastrous consequences because they often get coupled with the fluvial systems. They directly uh, drain into the river systems, blocking them, creating uh, another hazard called the landslide lake outburst floods. Uh, they run out to greater distances. So even if they're happening in smaller numbers, their coupling with the fluvial systems can make them more disastrous. So understanding these kind of processes uh, is very important to evaluate what kind of risk we are uh, dealing with. Similarly, in case of earthquake, this is again from the same study and we have the landslide density on y-axis and epicenter is where the Gurkha earthquake originated in terms of longitude. Now, highest density of landslide was not near the origin of the earthquake, but at some distance away from it that you see here um, as a peak. And this coincided with the 
amount of rainfall that was happening. So it appears again, uh, this, uh, the two systems, they were kind of working together. Earthquake was preparing the grounds, preparing the slopes, but the trigger was the uh, rainfall uh, here. So these dynamics, they are complex and need to be understood. Now, another important system in Himalayas are the glaciers. It's hard not to talk about glaciers when we talk about the Himalaya. This particular uh, field photo that you're looking at is uh, one of the largest glaciers in Indian Himalaya, Drangdrung glaciers in uh, Janskar. And they might have existed in um, Himalaya at least since 25 to 20 million years ago. Why is that? As we know that uh, when India and India collided with the Eurasian plate, um, there, there was an ongoing compression and uh, sediments and uh, the margins of the continents, they gained height. So at least to gain four kilometers of height and therefore to, uh, uh, to, to for precipitation to fall as snow, it must have taken around that much of time. So at least th since these many million years, glaciers have been eroding uh, the Himalayan terrain. They have been supplying a lot of sediment besides supplying uh, water uh, to the rivers. This is uh, Parkachi Glacier again from uh, Jhanskar Himalaya. I just wanted to show that how glaciers are not only suppliers of ice or storehouse of ice and in turn they are feeding um, the Himalayan uh, rivers on which our hydrological and ultimately food security depends. But this uh, grey mounds that you're seeing, they are the sediments generated by these glaciers. This is generated in the modern times. And, and if you are able to see these ridges, these sediments, they have been left um, in the geological past, maybe a few thousand uh, years old. And they directly then couple with the small, often with small tributary glacial streams, like this one. And that is what lends a lot of energy to these uh, rivers. So Himalayan rivers, they are not just supplying water, but they are mixture of sediment and water. And when I say sediment, they include not only the smaller particles, but boulders with as large as diameters of 10 meters or uh, so. This picture, I just wanted to show that how um, the moraines or the footprints of the past glacier advances looks like. So you see this inset picture. This is the Puche Glacier in uh, Ladakh. Very small glacier if like you consider the modern times. But it had advanced in the past and formed this huge pile of sediment. This is a lateral moraine just above the airport of, airport of uh, uh, Leh. If you ever happen to visit you will uh, see this uh, spectacular feature there. And this is all loose sediment um, ready to be mobilized. And Himalayan valleys, they, they are sequestering such huge piles of sediments left out by the glacier advances of the past, um, uh, which, which are ready to be mobilized in, in case of any um, extreme precipitation event or cloudburst events. So they are important source of sediments. That is uh, the takeaway message. Now, uh, we know that like we have discussed till now how the bedrock of the uh, Himalayan ranges, they are vulnerable, how seismicity uh, prepares, preconditions the ground for the disasters, how climate system interacts with it, how glaciers are a very important source of sediments as well which again get mobilized during uh, these extreme events particularly. On top of that, we are dealing with the global warming or changing climate. This is a very famous Keeling curve, as, as it is known as. And um, as many of you may know that it was Charles David, David Keeling who started recording the concentration of carbon dioxide in, since 1958 in uh, Mo uh, Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And thanks to him that we now have nearly uh, 50 years record of how anthropogenic emission of carbon dioxide has been increasing. Um, modern time, it is standing at about 
419 ppm just to put it in context uh, why we are worried so much with the carbon dioxide um, concentration this is this data is from the i score records going back to thousands of years so 800000 years from uh, present and you see that there's variation in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere which is related to natural cycles but never it had exceeded about 300 parts per million concentration but in last century due to the anthropogenic emissions we have uh, nearly led this have, we have nearly increased it by 50% or so and we all know that it's a greenhouse gases gas that leads to rise in temperature um ipcc 2018 just to put an emphasis on this rising in rise in temperature and particularly they have scientists they have considered the threshold value of uh, 1.5 degree centigrade that if we go beyond um the plus or the rise of 1.5 degree centigrade how it could be a tipping point for various systems uh, on the earth when we say tipping point it is usually used in a negative sense that means systems will react in such a way which we do not understand one uh, disruption will trigger the another disruption and Uh, many of the systems many of the biodiversity many of the uh, ecosystems will suffer the irreversible damage so that is why we are worried about uh, crossing this threshold and uh, this is uh, this graph is of this uh, temperature change and also the model data so on y axis we have the uh, change in temperature from 0 to 2 and these are the number of years till orange line this is the recorded data how the warming has been increasing uh, this is of course dependent on the um, carbon dioxide concentration and uh, after uh, 2017 these are the projections so if we follow the same trajectory when we will reach this tipping point of 1.5 degree about in 2040 if uh, we are able to lower somehow the, the uh, carbon dioxide emission we can lower down this rise of temperature and the worst case scenarios are also um projected through this data so how this translates for the how mount high mountain asia this global warming or rise in temperature if we talk about the temperature the first graph here uh, depicts the rise in temperature since 1951 and a comparison has been made between india and himalaya so on y axis uh, we see the temperature anomaly and x axis is the number of years in high mountain asia particularly in the himalaya it has been noticed that um, the change or the uh, temperature rise is always greater by uh, half a degree or so so actually we the himalayan region would have already reached a tipping point uh, before the entire globe sees it so that's that makes it even more vulnerable the second graph here shows that there has been an increase in the uh, wet day anomaly that means that uh, the number of days where the heavy rainfall would be uh, occurring they have increased in last um, last 70 years or uh, so and also uh, the entire hindu kush himalayan region it has seen uh, increase in the mean annual uh, precipitation so trends are similar to the global trends for the himalayan region and the high, high mountain asia but uh, the the impact or the magnitude is much more higher the direct implication of this rising temperature as we on low or uh, should i say the one of the most iconic images of the warming temperature are the shrinking glaciers this graph is from um, a publication which used the remote sensing based data and they tried to measure how the glaciers they have responded across the himalayan um, ranges to the rising in temperature and if you notice these lines they are dipping all are showing a negative trend suggesting that glaciers they have been uh, shrinking in the himalayan region except for 
uh, this region here where you would see some kind of anomalous uh, trend. This is the Karakoram uh, uh, region and the, the reasons given are different. One of them being that this region is um, um, dominated by the mid-latitude westerlies. So I'll not go into detail here, but uh, the overall picture is that glaciers have been shrinking. And these shrinking glaciers, they, uh, they generate another hazard called the glacial lake outburst floods, something that we saw in Sikkim recently. And uh, there was a recent study which has mapped all the glacial lakes across the Himalayan um, uh, region. And you see that all the blue greens are actually the um, potential uh, glacial lakes uh, which are either growing or which can uh, drain in the near future. I just wanted to, because uh, Sikkim had uh, happened, so I just wanted to uh, discuss briefly that how a glacial lake is formed. Uh, this is uh, by a publication which was actually uh, a study which was actually done on the South Lonak uh, Lake of Sikkim. And in fact, this lake has been monitored since 1990s. We always had the data, we knew how it was growing or shrinking, but uh, somehow all that information uh, could not be translated into preventing the loss of life or the infrastructure that has happened. Okay, so um, how a glacial lake is formed? Uh, this is a frontal moraine, something if uh, you can recall in the previous slide, I showed a spectacular pile of sediment in um, uh, uh, Ladakh above Leh town, uh, that was the moraine. So something similar kind of uh, deposit is here, which is deposited by this glacier in the past. And this glacier, when is receding back, it releases a lot of uh, melt water. And this melt water is not able to drain as a uh, frontal moraine causes the obstruction and a glacial lake is formed. Now, how this gla uh, glacial lake um, grows, or drains, it could vary uh, from case to case basis. Like in Sikkim, it drained catastrophically, coupled with the extreme uh, precipitation event. This is the South uh, Lonak uh, Lake, uh, published in this paper, where they uh, use data of uh, GSI, Geological Site Survey of India. Since 1990, it has been monitored and um, ultimately it was breached. Another type of uh, hazard that we often see in the Himalayas are the landslide lake outburst floods. Uh, in fact, if we talk about the northwestern and western Himalayan sector, perhaps the landslide lake outburst floods are more uh, important in terms of uh, disasters uh, here. This is a very famous picture of uh, Gona Tal or Gona Lake that was taken in 1894. This is is in Uttarakhand Himalaya, there's a small uh, tributary river of Alaknanda called the Birehi River. And if you've seen this photograph, there's a huge white colored scar here. This is a landslide scar. The landslide happened due to a rainfall event in 1893 in August. And this uh, debris of landslide blocked this re uh, river, small river, and created this huge lake behind. And this is the uh, today's picture just downstream of the lake. So this is the scar that is still visible, some leftover debris there. Of course, lake is uh, no more here. It had drained actually in two pulses. Uh, first breach was in um, after one year in 1894, again, uh, during the rains. Um, magnitude of flood was much higher. A lot of area was inundated, but no loss of life, no loss of infrastructure because of the proper planning. Second breach happened in 1970, much later when we had all the technology, early warning systems, but uh, many bridges were washed away, many lives were uh, lost. So just to put in context uh, that uh, how uh, we have made progress technology wise, probably science wise, but um, implementation of or the use of that knowledge has been uh, missing. But this is another important process that does affect uh, the Himalayan uh, system uh, very frequently. These flash floods, whether uh, glacial lake outburst floods, 
or landslide uh, lake out outburst floods they are again very much part of the nature of himalaya they are not something um foreign or alien to the himalayan terrain the proof is uh, in form of these paleo flood deposits we call them or slack water deposits uh, this is field photograph from satluj river where you see huge pile of uh, sand and if you clean the surface and look up closer they are actually couplets of sand and clay stacked over one another here each couplet uh, where the boundary is marked by this chocolate brown color it corresponds to one mega flood event the second mega flood event was more severe it could overtop the first one and deposited this layer and so on and so forth and uh, we have dated uh, this entire sequence the oldest flood was dated to about 14000 years so what i'm trying to emphasize is that uh, floods uh, beat from lof uh, gloffs or lofs or even extreme precipitation events as something we saw in 2013 in uttarakhand they have been part of the himalayan terrain and um, if we are to uh, live with it we must understand uh, it and then uh, make some preventing planning and measures they the floods will not go anywhere talking about the people uh, in this terrain uh, in the himalayan terrain we have been inhabiting this terrain since uh, at least 20000 years if we talk about tibet which is a high altitude land there has been evidence of permanent human occupation since 7000 years and agriculture since at least 3000 years these are the uh, handprints that have been um documented in tibet near a hot water fountain uh, handprint prints of probably a child so we have been occupying this uh, terrain um since quite a bit of uh, time this uh, if you talk about the indian himalaya particularly uh, of course the records they don't go back as yet to 20000 or so but we have seen such petroglyphs uh, in siachen Uh, valley nubra valley so uh, you see the paintings of uh, ibex and uh, their hunting scenes some felines are also drawn in here and um archaeologists this suggest that uh, these could be of iron age or so, so something about 3000 uh, years old uh, or so similarly we have some archaeological evidence from um, high altitudes the first the uh, pictures that you see the first panel that you see here they are from burial uh, in himachal satluj valley so skull skeletons and pottery and beads they were um, uncovered by the archaeologists and they have been dated uh, using carbon dating and there's another technique of optically stimulated luminescence dating technique to about 2500 to 3000 years and uh, similar kind of uh, cave burials have been found in the um, high altitude terrain trans himalayan region of uttarakhand so this is village of uh, malari and uh, this is again a glacial moraine and this cave was located here they have found uh, pottery gold mask uh, some skeletons they were also uncovered and again typology suggests them to be of similar kind of age so at least uh, since 3000 years or so human beings they have been occupying this terrain in form of sedentary uh, settlements that we are uh, aware of but probably uh, even until recently till historical times we have been living uh, harmoniously with the terrain we understood how to uh, interact with the terrain given its fragility example is shown in this picture this is a uh, village near chamoli where you see that all houses they are constructed along a ridge line none of these houses they were occupied on the creeping slopes which they terrace and use for uh, farming and of course um, you see the local material is being used the height of the buildings is not um, going beyond one or two uh stories this is another example this is a glacial moraine again 
and there's a small village nestled here people they have not even moved a boulder and they have constructed their house uh, houses again uh, within keeping in consideration the terrain boundary conditions the architecture that we had uh, or people used they are again terrain friendly this is a earthquake resistant house known as kat kunni uh, in himachal or and uttarakhand made with wood and stone and this has been dated to about 400 years so it has withstood some high magnitude recorded high magnitude earthquakes as well so probably we have been living in this terrain understanding uh, its complex nature and adjusting uh, our behavior accordingly but what went wrong in the present times example one is uh, from le uh, if you remember there was a devastating flood in 2010 there was an extreme precipitation event in lay town and this is the picture of uh, the market that got washed away now why this market was washed because we had clogged this dried up uh, river bed which was actually the natural pathway of the water and when when um, this stream or stream or rivulet get got activated due to this extreme precipitation event it just swept away whatever it uh, came in the uh, way not only that this uh, construction material it kind of obstructed the debris flows uh, temporarily so it was kind of a temporary landslide dam you can say which uh, ultimately burst with a much uh, higher uh, impact and magnitude we have also obstructed the free flow pathways of the major rivers this is example of uh, vishnu priyag hydro power project just be, uh, below badrinath this was before 2013 disaster luscious green forests uh, nice river flowing we had a barrage there and uh, with one night of rainfall this was uh, completely destroyed and this is uh, the picture that uh, we took when i went there in i think 2021 so even now uh, this project has not recovered uh, this uh, this rainfall event has pushed in so much of paraglacial sediment into the valley sediment that was left uh, by the glaciers of the past that they are still not able to the reservoir still uh, keeps on filling with every seasonal uh, rainfall that paraglacial sediment was brought down by this small rivulet stream khiro ganga Uh, this is again before the disaster so all the moraines paraglacial sediments they are somewhere here up in the valley and uh, with the rainfall those sediments they got mobilized and this is how the uh, stream uh, or the rivulet looked like and and it mobilized all the sediments downstream towards the uh, barrage we are also another uh, type of um, mega infrastructure uh, i should say are the uh, road widening projects that are going on in the uh, himalaya of course roads are the uh, lifelines of the mountains we need them but um, how they are executed how they are planned that uh, becomes very important this is a field photograph of uh, a segment in uttarakhand how the muck is being directly dumped in, into the river um, i mean this would not only affect the slope stability but this would also ultimately kill the river all the biota uh, all the aquatic life inside it and this is a google earth uh, imagery the road widening is taking place of course on the upper slope but you see there's lot of collateral damage they have simply dumped the muck over the forest destroying the forest um, beneath the road and also there's lot of collateral damage happening on the upper slopes so this slope became unstable due to road widening and further landslides have been uh, triggered so uh, this is how we are interacting with the terrain in the modern times just to give a context from uh, where we have come and in this um, sediment that gets dumped into the river is again actually mobilized by the river either during the seasonal floods or during extreme precipitation events and they get deposited as we saw in shrinagar town in uttarakhand 2013 uh, it was uh, literally they had uh, the river had drowned the entire town in muck another type of uh, bad example i would say of the modern day interaction is the 
uh, urban growth uh, that we are seeing. This is uh, Joshi Mutt, which uh, became famous after it started sinking, or rather um, sinking with an accelerated rate, should I say that. So this is an old picture of the same town taken in 1850. Again, you see very few hamlets, uh, very nicely part of the terrain. And this is how uh, it looks like in 2022. Uh, we literally have no plan uh, for the Himalayan towns um, in terms of terrain carrying capacity, how much population, how much structure, what type of structure, how many tourists, how many vehicles, uh, can this terrain uh, bear, how much resources it has, we really don't have any idea. So this is another major concern. And, uh, when, and then there comes a threshold or a tipping point when uh, the terrain, it gives way. And we are inviting disasters and hazards, uh, basically, uh, into our lives. Uh, so far, the early warning systems are concerned. Um, it's it's uh, it's not a very happy picture. Some good examples are there from uh, Nepal, where EC Mode uh, has done some considerable work with the community, and they have built very simple early warning systems. But uh, so far, at least uh, what valleys I have visited in Himachal and uh, Uttarakhand, and even they have started in uh, now JNK and Ladakh. We just put up a board like this um, in near the reservoir or with avalanche, avalanche can come any any time because of global warming. And that's it. That's that's the state of early warning system. Of course, we need to go beyond much uh, beyond that. Although um, how much and where early warning systems would be the most beneficial, that is another topic in itself. We cannot have early warning in every little valley of the Himalaya. Uh, the terrain is like that. But of course, certain spot, hot spots can be identified. Uh, we do have a lot of information on that. And some kind of um, warning system where community gets 15, 20 minutes to uh, vacate, that can be established. Uh, currently, it's, it's uh, not in the state that we would like them to be. So where do we go from here? Uh, we know the terrain is vulnerable. Uh, we have also seen how uh, sensibly we have been interacting or our ancestors have been interacting with the terrain, how we have overtaken uh, and kind of violating the terrain boundary conditions and that, that has made the things uh, worse. So uh, I often ask myself that, um, how can I contribute? I mean, um, how do I uh, contribute in making the things better? So one thing for us, all of us, I think, uh, belong to a gathering here um, who have taken interest in such issues. So being a science communicator is uh, important. There was, I think, a study, I'm forgetting the exact, exact reference, IPCC, I think, has quoted them, um, that uh, talking about uh, issues like risks, disasters, forming collaborations, like Suchi Smitha was also saying, having multi-speciality teams, all this uh, creates uh, an atmosphere, uh, creates pressure for uh, the decision makers. And that is, I think, where our uh, maximum role could be, being a science communicator, um, having collaborations with diverse uh, fields and um, contributing for the societal uh, benefit. Also, it is uh, helpful to know the worst possible scenarios, although uh, the, I mean, the flip side is that um, it often scares people and the worst possible scenario may not actually materialize, but it is uh, important to know that from the risk management perspective and also preventive planning perspective. And warnings from the history, not only from the recent ones, from our uh, like lifetime, but from the geological uh, archives. They have been uh, telling us that these disasters or hazards, they are part of the terrain. So uh, probably it's best to know the worst possible scenario and then plan uh, accordingly. Also, we have to understand that uh, risks, they are complex. They are multidimensional. Uh, how we choose to respond 
uh, that that would also make a difference um, how this risk is amplified. And each one of us is actually a stakeholder, be it a person who's staying in that uh, river valley of Alaknanda, uh, someone who's staying in the downstream, dependent on that water that is coming from the Himalaya, or somebody maybe living in Delhi or Ahmedabad, um, connected uh, to the system by economy, where it takes one rupee to prevent a disaster, but it takes 10 rupees to uh, sort of um, after post-disaster treatment. So everyone is actually a stakeholder. It's not that it concerns uh, a few. It, it leads to more complex issues uh, in so society as well. And ultimately, science has to find its way into policy making. I'm not sure how this will happen, but I think uh, being a science communicator, uh, keeping up the pressure and not just becoming visible when something happens, but a continuous um, talk or a continuous communication about these things probably will ultimately force science into policy making. We have a lot of knowledge and data available. We have seen that in case of Joshimat. We've seen that in case of um, 2021 Ronti Guard happened. We have seen that in case of Sikkim, uh, but it's somehow not percolating uh, down into the uh, system. So yeah, and uh, I found this very last point. Uh, every individual counts. Uh, UN uh, UNEP uh, has listed down certain um, goals. You can go through them. Maybe how an individual can contribute. Um, or mitigating the climate change. So what I've understood from that was that uh, recycling, reuse, and making our lifestyle sustainable, it ultimately does have an impact, maybe even if it is at a smaller level. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shubra. This was very enlightening. And uh, okay, maybe we can stop sharing the screen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. This was such an overarching presentation and it brings together uh, like the disasters all across the Himalayan region and especially your perspective of given, giving this deep history of disasters in the region was very enlightening. So, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'll open it up for the audience first and we can take questions. Uh, maybe people can raise their hand and then. Uh, uh, OK, maybe if when people are thinking, I have I have one sort of question. Um, one of the things because you were talking about these historical mega flood events. So uh, I have just come to Sikkim after the uh, floods and what you talked about in terms of these paraglacial sediments which get deposited in the river along the uh, river line and then uh, keeps accumulating. So historically, like tracing the long history, how does the sediment, uh, what is the next stage of these sediments? How long does it take to uh, go, etc.? Like what is the future of these kind of new deposits in new places, which is changing the terrain after these disasters? Okay, that's that's a very good question. And there are a lot of people are trying to understand actually how sediment gets uh, mobilized within the river system. So there are two things I talked about. One was the flood deposits, the finer material that you were seeing, sand, silt couplet uh, that I was talking about. They are often very less in volume uh, because uh, they get deposited in a very sheltered locations. So probably their resident time is uh, should be older than the bigger particles that you see, the paraglacial sediments, the cobbles, the pebbles, or the regular stream which uh, mobilizes the sediment probably every seasonal flood. So said, uh, the resident time would vary. And um, uh, what uh, people they have dated from rivers in the, at least in the Northwest in Himalaya, if I talk about Ganga uh, or Satluj, uh, there the sediment resident time is about 20,000 years or so. So it takes 20,000 years from sediment, from upper catchment, then to reach uh, probably exit the mountain system at least. So there are many cycles of deposition uh, and erosion involved in there. 
but it varies from river to river. In Indus, the same timeline that has been given is 200,000 years. So it varies from river to river, catchment to catchment. I, I hope I could understand your question. No, no, yes, uh, uh, you have understood my question correctly. Uh, people, so thinking of policy and like, you know, after all of these events in uh, Uttar, uh, in the Western Himalayas, in the East, so this kind of timeline is mind boggling for anybody trying to think of what does rehabilitation in these landscapes or uh, reestablishment of this landscape look like. I know, the, uh, and the scope of 20,000 years or more is something, uh, how do you think it would affect policymakers? So you were talking about uh, science being applicable to policy. So in terms of rehabilitation of landscapes, in terms of management of damaged landscapes, uh, what would a scientist like you have to say to uh, people uh, in terms of how to manage post-disaster scenarios? I think um, uh, for policy making, this 20,000 years timeline would not matter that much because I'm talking about, I'm ignoring uh, the cycles of erosion and deposition intermittently that are happening, which become very important for us uh, because of our limited lifespan. So. Um, in terms of um, policy making, I would not want to go and even I, what um, what is my understanding, people who come from this disaster background, they don't want to go into post-disaster scenario because that requires 10 times more energy, 10 times more uh, resources. So we would want to stop it uh, at the preventive stage, looking for, uh, in terms of landscape, if I say stable landscape, at least we know that what kind of landscapes, uh, what kind of geomorphic settings would be uh, apt for settlement or, say, um, construction of roads or things like that. Uh, so that much can be done. But uh, so far, the urban growth is concerned. We really don't have any clue about the terrain carrying capacity. It's like uh, everything is unregulated. So we need to understand that how much uh, a particular town or a village township like Joshimat, small township, can sustain. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so I'll wait and uh, if there are other questions. Yeah. Uh, we have a hand. Yeah, let me just jump in, uh, not knowing that much about the technical aspects of what uh, Shubra has been talking about. Uh, but since at CIR, we have been thinking also about issues of sustainability, and we did a year-long project based on that. I was very curious as to why, Ashubra, at the end of your talk, you spoke about sustainability as being an individual-focused effort. Because it seems to me that, especially in precarious communities like in the Himalayas, these have to be community efforts. One individual you know, choosing not to wear something or choosing to... Uh, live a particular kind of life or eat a certain kind of thing is hardly going to matter. These precarious communities are so community dependent, it seems to me. But this is a, like a lay person's view. I wondered what you had to say about that. No, actually, I was, uh, you're right that uh, all these efforts, they would make a difference if we are driven together as a community. But I also wanted to bring on because often, uh, at least for me personally, sometimes I think that what am I doing personally to stop this or to contribute this? So it was kind of I was looking for answer probably for myself, like what is in my hand? So I'm not saying that, OK, policymakers don't listen to us. They don't listen to us uh, or this one is not implementing fine. So it was in from that angle that uh, what we can do individually. But you're right that uh, they, these are community based efforts and especially in um, Himalayan societies. Yeah. Oh, Neil, you have a question. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Subra. Um, I have a very simple question in terms of the information availability or information sharing. Because you know, when we talk about urban interest, so, you know, settlements growing is one thing where historic settlements probably would grow over time. That's one part. But what we're seeing in the recent years is the expansion, uh, the building of the roads. I think this has become a very common phenomenon across the Himalayas. And as you rightly pointed out, that is triggering a lot of, you know, subsequent effects. Now, um, this connects to the policy also, but I think maybe fundamentally it relates to the 
layering of the information available to these local governments or the community who are motivated to build infrastructure and all that. Um, what is your thought? I mean, is there a, uh, like, what is the status of information available to these stakeholders and in what form? Because, uh, like, for example, if uh, there would be a way for us to use, let's say, Google Earth or any such openly available platforms to to sense the different layers or vulnerabilities, that would be one thing at least useful for researchers like us to be proactive and do something, right? But when it comes to getting satellite images and really, you know, getting those things, then it's not easily accessible. So what do you think, you know, uh, are ways that we can work around? Because if we all take responsibility in us, there has to be a way, you know, so even if there is a will. Uh, so, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on what are the possible scenarios today to at least get the basic data that uh, a researcher can use. I mean, researcher doesn't mean just, you know, whoever is specialized in geology, but maybe, you know, infrastructure related or even anthropologist. Any, any tips? Uh, any? Researcher, you mean as a citizen staying in yeah, that or, or any... for academic purpose? Yeah, no, no, yeah, for academic purpose also, but, you know, people who are sensitive, like you said, that individual responsibility we need to think of. So those of us who think about it and would like to do something, um, what are the platforms we can look up to get at least the basic information to to collect and so that that can be shared with the, the local governments or infrastructure uh, group, you know, making groups. Uh, because I mostly work in the trans in Nepal and, and I've seen okay. this happening a lot. And, and But the but the bottom line is, uh, you know, there is a lot of politics involved here and nobody has the yeah. time to wait for a research and all that. So unless yeah, we have yeah. a mechanism to really flag that, oh, you know, this road, this road should not be driven this way. Yeah. Uh, you know, but then what I personally feel uh, this thing is I, I can browse through the Google Earth, but I don't get to the the, the information layers that, you know, could be used and, and make a case for. Uh, so I don't know whether I'm making sense, but I'm, I'm also like you. Know, thinking yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I, I am getting your point. You yeah. can you can correct me <laughs> if not. Yeah. Uh, I think there are two things. One thing that you have talked about very important is that how do we get the information? So I, I see it as two parts, like as a citizen, uh, say I'm a resident of, uh, let's talk about Joshimat uh, since it's um, uh, it has uh, it has shot to fame. So if as a resident of Joshimat, I had to plan my house, I have no information what you're talking about. I cannot just go on a portal, say, okay, this land sinking is there, this has that history. So I don't have that uh, access, firstly. It would be a nice way to start if um, we started thinking, the system started thinking in that direction and that information is made uh, available to public, uh, to a layman, so that he does not have to go through a very complicated process to access it. So that is not uh, there. I think second problem, again, I'm uh, talking from a citizen point of view is uh, many times we are not even aware, like until unless my house breaks down, I did not care what was happening there. So I think that kind of sensitivity is also kind of absent in our society. You blame it on education, you blame it on whatever, but uh, I think that short sightedness is also there. Uh, that is the second thing that I feel uh, is there. And uh, when it comes to norms, like I can give you example, I ha I have resided in Shimla also. So there was uh, some period for two, three years, they would enforce norms very rigorously, uh, whether it comes to construction or kind of material you are using. And next year, uh, they all are gone. So this mixed kind of response from the system also, where uh, the site is also not getting a clear picture on probably the importance or sensing the importance. It's only after series of disasters. I mean, the positive point is that I'm hoping that uh, we, would, we would be sensitized towards this thing. So I think that is uh, from a citizen's perspective. For a, a researcher, I think, we, again, it all... Uh, mm, how it connects to the society because you are if you're trying to prepare a map a vulnerable uh, vulnerability map or something there are atlases uh, there are I, I i think there's some kind of uh, a massive program also launched by isro on uh, layers and making these uh, database ready but it'll take some time but how that percolates into uh, the common this thing i don't know 
really. I think it'll take time. Other questions from students? Uh, yes. So we have Mridula and then Sangeeta. Mridula, you can go first. Um, hi, am I audible? Sorry, I'm traveling. So uh, yeah, yeah, yes. you're audible. Hello? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the engaging and so, so in, such an informative presentation. Um, well, my question was regarding, I mean, it was very interesting to see that you mentioned about the Kartkuni system of construction and also the logic of uh, settlement pattern, uh, like how traditionally uh, hamlets are uh, built on the ridge and not on the valley. So it was nice to see, uh, these, uh, see these in the presentation. So my question was related to... Uh, like, you know, there is definitely this inherent uh, traditional knowledge system, which has lasted for so many years. So are there any efforts going on to uh, integrate this knowledge system to the advanced scientific data collection? And uh, yeah, so that's my main question. And do you see that in near future, uh, the combination of traditional knowledge system along with the scientific data finding its way into the poli policy making? Because very often, as a scientific community, we also tend to kind of uh, take these aspects for granted, and they are not always empirically proven as well. Uh, so yeah, so just want to know what your thoughts on the, that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mridula. Uh, so when you are saying about uh, incorporation of wisdom with the scientific um, Technologies you are referring to the archaeology, uh, this architect or anything. Uh, well, uh, right now I'm referring to mainly the construction knowledge system, architectural knowledge system regarding uh, right, right from the site selection to the construction material its survival uh, throughout all these disasters. So definitely they have survived. It's like a time tested system that we are already seeing. And uh, most of us are aware of that, but we don't see these observations uh, like, you know, that are put forward in a very strong empirical manner uh, in front of the decision makers. So, yeah, I was curious to know whether there are any such efforts going yeah, on. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I may not be the right person to answer it uh, because I'm not an ex expert in this domain, but uh, whatever I know, I can share from that. I don't think so. There are any, um, what should I say? I mean, there are certain building codes uh, where you test for X, Y, Z construction, uh, the structural stability or things like that. But uh, I, I don't think so that there are any efforts or there are any guidelines to what kind of construction material you should be using. So I think an individual is free to do so. Um, I do see uh, that there is kind of, a, uh, what should I say, a preference for the older architecture. I don't know if you can call it craze or whatever from commercialization point of view also. So people, they, they are getting inclined towards it. And also uh, with experience, we know uh, that at least for the extreme weather conditions, like even in the lower hills where you have scorching summer, we had those uh, mud wall uh, houses and people are realizing how um, those, um, uh, I mean, houses, they are better. And there are institutes also uh, like SERI, I think, which uh, deals with these traditional architecture. But uh, policy wise, I don't think so. It's really talked about in that much uh, sense. Mm. I think good example would be uh, if government uh, promotes those kind of things in government, uh, um, constructing a government uh, building or things like that. But I, I don't think so. There's anything uh, like that in that direction. There's, there are definitely research going on, um, academic exercise wise, like series there. I, I'm aware of, uh, I'm forgetting that its name. It's an uh, institute which uh, deals with earthquakes, building codes. They are also incorporating some research uh, on the traditional architecture, like you said, empirically um, defining it, CBRI or something. But 
I don't think so. It has a wider reach as such for the general public. But academically, it is going on. I'm hoping it'll in time it will percolate further down. Uh, Sangeeta, you can. Just a second. Am I visible? Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, Sangeeta. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation, ma'am. Uh, my uh, question uh, may may not be related to the presentation. I just wanted to understand and ask. Uh, uh, recently, they found lithium in Jammu Kashmir. Um, does drilling minerals cause trouble to that geological space? And how do you address, like we need minerals. So when we drill minerals, mm -hmm. what are the impacts that are caused uh, in that geological space? Uh, I mean, obviously it's not Joshi mud kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. but like, yeah. uh, how do you deal with that? Because we need both. We need minerals and also we need to protect ourselves. Yes, so you are uh, specifically, uh, when you're talking about mineral mining, you're specifically talking about mountain regions or anywhere? Oh, no, ma'am. The, the, they had, uh, uh, there was a large amount of lithium found uh, in Jammu Kashmir. So that was yeah. in the, just related to that. Okay, just related to that. Uh, so firstly, I don't think so. it is, uh, I mean, of course, it came in media and all. But I think it is not a very large amount or they still have to figure out how to harness it. Um, regard, regarding mining, so far the mountains are concerned. Again, as you said, if there is some resource, we would like to tap it. But then I think you have to go in for cost benefit analysis. Uh, I'll give an example in Himachal again. Um, there, there were some cement factories that were set up, I think, 30 years back or so. Why? Because there were mountains of limestone there, very cheap, everything. But what they have done is they have completely flattened the area. That mountain is gone. And not only that, the surrounding uh, region, it has severe respiratory problem because of the dust is constantly there. So if you're OK with that kind of uh, cost and what kind of benefit you are deriving, I think you'll have to go in for cost benefit analysis and rule in favor of a project. Uh, if you feel that uh, benefit is, you are okay with the cost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, other questions from the audience? So uh, at the beginning, you had also in the middle mentioned how the South Lona, for example, there has been research in since the 90s and uh, there is enough data and yet... Uh, there was not enough warning, there was not enough mitigation. So if you can say a little bit more on what went wrong between communicate like information and communication. I know this is not your region of work, but nonetheless, if you have uh, Yeah. What what I understand, uh like this was kind of and of course they uh, recognized the lake uh in nineties. And not only the South Lonok Lake, Sikkim has wide, uh, I mean many lakes which are classified as dangerous, not dangerous, uh, like that. And they were monitoring it remote sensingly. But I think it uh, it was not that we were not aware of it, but we somehow chose not to do anything about it. And uh, also this mindset of, I don't know, that there's a regular routine way of approaching things, which we are not really changing. Uh, and repeatedly, uh, at least in Himalaya, we are getting warnings uh, every year. This year also it was Himachal and Uttarakhand. In Sikkim also, you knew that there's a, a catastrophic lake which could burst from there. You don't establish a worthy warning system. On top of that, you have built uh, hydropower barrages in the downstream area. If, if it burst, which it did, it would obstruct the flow. You have not... Uh, like. Uh, done anything to vacate the area or make it a no construction zone. Inundation levels have been calculated uh, the, with modeling that how much worse case scenario was it. That was also done. I really don't understand like why it was not done. It was like it, it's there always. It was there always. You knew it will um, burst. But uh, I don't know. There's a set uh, insensitivity set into system or what it is. 
it's just not there uh so again then how do scientists try to influence because you know for development uh, etc then uh, uh, these kind of uh, calculations these kind of uh, figures facts and figures which are there are ignored so how do we build a critical mass where these figures are not ignored and uh, say road construction dam construction will have to take uh, account of the worst case scenario because it seems that their bottom line doesn't match if they build according to worst case scenario so what can i know it's a hypothetical utopian almost question but what can we do yeah. about it yeah i i don't know such as with i mean it's uh, sometimes it's frustrating also that we are only talking about it but i think that is what we can do the best because uh, we are our prime job is to generate uh, the knowledge the honest kind of factual knowledge uh, that is done and second bit that we can do is um, like uh, you are organizing seminar you are taking time to write maybe popular articles uh, just talking about it sensitizing people because i think it will ultimately come from the people if there is enough uh, pressure be it political or from some institutions um that is the only thing that comes to my mind um uh, that can really move the things forward and um, i don't know i should say this or not but somehow these disasters which have happening one after the other i think that will also hammer it uh, into our minds that we cannot go on like this forever so i think that will also probably trigger something for a change okay uh, yes let us i mean that that would be the hope um, any any other questions from the audience one okay one last thing which uh, that day when we had lunch you were talking about the also this bottom line of road construction and how if you increase the width of the road the profitability and the cost increases so if you could go back to that a little that was a very interesting observation you were making in terms of the link between why uh, you know uh, warnings are ignored also for uh, economic gains so if you could tell us a little bit more about that before we end yeah it's, it's a very controversial topic although but uh, uh, the thing is that it's like again uh, we are basically not optimizing or putting uh, the best interest of uh, the environment plus um, what should i say the balance of how much widening you would require it will be sufficient if we go in for say x uh, width of the road but of course if i dig little bit more extra uh, i am making in more money and everybody in the chain is making uh, more money so economics is uh, always um, i mean uh, uh, i think a plain way way where in ways probably we i i don't know i should comment on this or not like uh, another example comes to my mind is of tapo one it i think is it is under construction since uh, 2006 or something every time it is being washed uh, by the floods but i really don't know why it is being uh, still constructed there so clearly some money is coming in somebody is getting some gain so that kind of uh, dynamics i was referring to at that time Uh, okay we have a comment question slash comment from uh, roshan uh, roshan rai who works here in darjeeling so the sikkim darjeeling and uh, okay so let me read this out the sikkim darjeeling and bangladesh disaster is yet an another event that questions us all and uh, is there a more proactive way of addressing this uh, then this uh, i told you so reports by scientists like this kind of you know that scientists already know and it continues into the notion that there is just uh, the science policy intersect is to be looked into and what response what responsibility is there that the data sharing process has to be rethought so rethinking data sharing and also this like you know how do we go beyond the scientists like we knew and nothing was done about it, this kind of approach yeah so uh, i would take the side of the scientists here we poor things cannot say anything other than i told you so until unless you give me some power of decision making 
or holding some person accountable that okay i gave you this x plan why did you not implement it why do you think uh, what else can i do like really if you make me part of a decision making committee uh, based on my expertise expertise give me the power of decision making and hold me account accountable all, uh, as well mind you right now we don't have we have zero accountability um so far if you look at all these events who gave clearance to what nobody questions that so accountability is another issue i don't think so a scientist can uh, go beyond that until you give the power that kind of power into the hands and uh, data sharing i think um, the problem of data sharing is right there's problem of data sharing but not so much from the perspective of a scientist like when if i publish some research uh, i give clause either i make it open there and then or i give a clause that if somebody requires it i will share it problem of data sharing comes in from probably from the big um, corporates like uh, i am struggling to get uh, data of discharge of himalayan rivers because i wanted to model something that data is classified so again uh, it's it's not really a scientist but institution and organizations uh, although again uh, some kind of positive step has been taken in uh, context of spatial data i think uh, uh, lo- uh, this uh, laws they have been revised in 2022 so a lot of data will be available uh, by the government institutions institutions they are the custodians of those kind of raw data which i believe uh, he's talking about so some progress is there they are uh, making it open open source but uh, scientists uh, usually they don't uh, hold repositories of data they are uh, institutions and governments they are custodians of that Uh, so who 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 has the data which you are not able to access uh, the exact <laughs> okay like we can talk it about later okay. maybe it's <laughs> not on record <laughs> okay uh, so we are out of time uh, and thank you again so much shubhra for uh, giving us this overarching view of uh, disasters of, of the terrain of the himalayas since like millions of years and then also uh, uh thinking about as you said there has been habitation in this region at least in the tibetan region for 20000 years so that also puts this like our blimp into view in terms of how small we are in the time frame yes. nonetheless important questions of how we cannot also uh the conditions of survival in this region have changed so much so how how do we go forward how do we think about these issues in 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 the context of current scenarios current population growth current development etc so uh, thank you and we hope to continue this conversation bring in these kinds of insights into our next talk we will have by aditi sara who will be talking about risk in the uh, in kashmir in a cultural perspective but we hope we can generate interesting interdisciplinary conversations about risk uh thank you everyone and so we can end for today uh, thank, thank you so much thank you for giving me this opportunity i really enjoyed <laughs> thank you